City's 2014-2015 series. Um, it's been quite a year. Um, uh, a couple years ago, we did one workshop, and then the next in the spring, and then the next year we did like a couple, two, three throughout the year, and then last year we did every other month, and then this year we decided every month was a good idea. So the second Wednesday of every month, or third, this is the third, the third Wednesday of every month we come here, and um, it's been a really good series, and we added the webinar um, as well this year, which n not only are we projecting it. Um, on the webinar right now, but we record it and we put it on uh, the website so that people can look at it after they miss it. And um, did I say who I was? I'm Diana McEwen. I direct the Metro Region of Search and I've been involved in Reset City since pretty much the ground floor. And um, I I took kind of just a little bit of um, facilitator, you know, facilitator of this workshop series um, privilege to come up here. I've been um, some of you may know I was on a little personal sabbatical for a couple months this winter um, and I'm working, transitioning back part time and I just really want to thank my team um, because they really stepped in a big way and made this thing keep going and you probably didn't even notice I wasn't here. Um, and Patrick especially, Patrick um, Mathwick, I actually call him Patrick the Great. Um, he has done incredible work keeping this thing running, doing all the webinar stuff when I couldn't figure it out and I just, can everybody give my hand please? Member um, serving with the Great Plains Institute where I work, and it's been a great and a privilege, and I'm so thankful for him. And um, so I just wanted to say that, and then I wanted to let folks know that uh, because it's the end of the series, after this you will get um, a survey not only for this workshop, but if you went to any of the workshops, where we want to get some input about how this year was, because this was a big year for us, doing every month. We had the webinar. We want some feedback because we're looking at how to structure it next year going forward. What was most useful? What pieces did you really like? What pieces maybe did you not like? Um, topics that you really want to see that you really, you know, want to um, get more information about. And also kind of the kind of engagement. Do you want it to be talked at? Do you want a discussion? Do you want to really dig in? We really want that information because we're here to provide whatever you need. It doesn't do us a lot of good to provide what we think you need if you don't need it. So I um, appreciate you filling out that survey um, that's coming out pretty soon here. Um, a couple of announcements. There is uh, a living streets workshop um, that the Alliance for Sustainability is putting on on Wednesday, May 27th at the Washington County Government Center. Um, we'll include a little piece on that when we set up the um, follow-up to this workshop. Uh, and I also want to let folks know that there is a Metro Energy Policy Coalition Energy Summit happening on June 4th um, at the Dakota County um, Park. Thompson Park um, in the Dakota Lodge from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it is regarding the, um, the nature of our, our grid and distribution and how that's changing um, with you know, solar and more people producing electricity and electric vehicles and all these things that are happening. Um, we're really going to get into a big discussion with some great speakers. And I will also include a link for that. It's $25 if you're not. Um, one of the MEPC members, which are six, six of the counties, Met Council and MAC are the members. But, uh, so it's, it's only 25 bucks. It's pretty cheap and it's going to be a really great day. So I just wanted to make sure to highlight that as well. Um, anything else? Did I forget anything? No? Well, thank you so much for coming to our last workshop of the series. We're excited to uh, get out a survey and really find out what people think. So please take a few minutes to fill that out and whatever you thought. To give us some feedback will be helpful so that we make this as useful for you as possible. And uh, oh yeah, the hashtag is on the screen. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Um, uh, Green Step WKSHP. Um, I'll be in the back of the room um, tweeting. That is why I'm the only one of the little tiny table. So I'm going to be tweeting from both the Green Step City account and um, my own personal account. But we've been trying to do some social media. I try to uh, pick up and um, tag cities. The organizations, um, etc., that are speaking, please, you know, follow that hashtag, retweet if you're a Twitter person, and um, thank you so much for being here. And I will introduce Laura. Thank you so much, Laura, for helping to put this workshop together. All of the good work today for this workshop is Laura. Laura Milberg from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Please give Laura a round of applause. Thank you. Oh, it's a lot of help from Patrick and others. So, um, 
I just want to say quickly, the survey that Diana was talking about is for the Mulberry Stem Workshop series. Um, there's also a little survey for anybody who wants APA credits today. That's a paper survey that needs to be turned in at the end. If you want APA credits, there's a sign-in sheet. If you want GBCI credits, there's a sign-in sheet that needs to be uh, filled out. So just everybody make sure that they're on there if they want to get them. Yeah. Check, in, um, just check in with Michael if you need the credits. Laura, I forgot something really, really important. Sure. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I want to thank SL Energy for being a workshop series sponsor. They sponsored all of the workshops for the whole year. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been great to be in partnership with you. We really appreciate it. I'll be tweeting and tagging SL Energy Minnesota today. Um, and today's um, workshop sponsor, uh, Perkins and Will, for stepping up and, and helping sponsor this particular workshop. So um, thank you so much. We that's how that's why you have bagels and fruit and stuff like that. It's because of sponsorship and that's how we get to put this all together. So thank you everyone. Sorry. Um, also um, a quick announcement. The room has to be turned over pretty quickly at 11 a.m. So as soon as the workshop is over, if everybody could step into the foyer with their stuff and then we could continue conversations there instead of in the room. Um, so uh, I want to say that starting in January 2014, MBCI applied for an in-kind assistance grant from the Georgetown Climate Center. The topic was Minnesota's preemptive building code and how to provide more flexibility to local governments to increase the resilience of their built environments to the changing climate. So our application was approved and this began our journey. <laughs> Uh, first collaborating on the report with Sarah, uh, the Georgetown Center, uh, Climate Center report titled Minnesota Options to Increase Climate Resilience in Buildings. We have some paper copies in the folder back by Patrick. It's online, so if you don't have a paper copy, please look at the report online. It's got tons of great information in it. Um, as I uh, sought opportunities for Sarah to present her research, um, I reached out to a longtime contact in the architectural community, that appears. And as we were talking, Dr. Kathy's mentioned that I might be interested in the new resiliency action list. I said, what's that? And so that sparked planning for this workshop and the other three that are in the series. Uh, so our first presenter, Sarah Hoberger, is a senior fellow at the Harrison Institute for Public Law at Georgetown Law. She works with state and local governments to help them protect their most vulnerable residents from the public health and environmental impacts and intense uh, and impacts of heat and intense precipitation in urban areas. Her relevant publications incur, include Urban Heat Adaptation, a toolkit for local governments uh, from 2012, and that's online, as well as several funding compendiums for urban heat adaptation in 2013, and a co-authorship on preparing our communities for climate impacts, recommendations for federal action in 2014. Uh, and in general, the Georgetown Climate Center has a great website with tons of resources. Her education includes a BA from Yale University at uh, JD and an LLM from Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, we're so pleased to have Sarah here. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Laura, for that great introduction. Thank you, Dan, and everyone else for having me here. And thanks to all of you for coming to hear about climate change and building resilience. Um, I want to start off by saying a couple quick things. Uh, the first of which is, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> so just to frame all of this, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a planner, I'm not an architect. Um, you're going to hear some fantastic stuff from Doug on the nitty gritty of building and slopes and all kinds of stuff later. This is not what this is about. Um, what this particular presentation is designed to be for. Uh, is to really sort of talk, walk you through the basics of what Minnesota is expecting in terms of climate impact um, and what that means for your building. Um, and starting, I want to have a conversation with all of you um, about code. I'm aware. It's kind of stuff I like to do. Um, so I want to have a conversation with you all about having seen the impact, having seen sort of what those potential impacts could do to some of your building stock. Um, what kinds of things you might like to do to your code? Uh, because our analysis centered, of course, on your state code. 
challenges with me. Uh, so, all that being said, um, I'd like to sort of start off at the beginning. So, Georgia Climate Center, uh, Laura introduced us nicely, but just for a little bit of context, we work primarily with state and local governments around the country on legal and policy issues related to climate change, both reducing emissions and preparing. Uh, for the impact. I work exclusively on the preparing for impact side, uh, so that's the perspective that I'm coming from. And we were really excited to be able to work with NPCA uh, on some of this building code resilience work. So, Minnesota is already changing. Sort of the first point I want to make is that when we talk about climate change often, um, it seems to be with an air of sometime in the future, things will be different. I don't know, I, you know, it seems like really far away because my kids will have to worry about it. Um, the first point I wanted to make, and those of you who are paying close attention will notice, um, these precipitation maps are all past. Minnesota's climate has been changing for quite some time, and I don't want to overstate this and say that climate change with capital C is, is responsible for all of it. However, I think the idea that climate conditions are completely static. Um, it's really not true. You can see precipitation patterns changing to the average annual rainfall uh, over the past century. And I think to assume that the historic curve um, is necessarily going to happen in the future is okay, I think. Um, there are two big impacts I want to talk about today. The Minnesota is the the first of which is heavy precipitation, um, and the second of which is heat. Now, heat is sort of the most intuitive uh, of the impacts that people think of when they think about climate change, right? We all know it's going to be hotter. Um, and I wanted to talk for just a minute about what that means. So, this is a picture of the Chicago heat wave from 1995, which I'm sure many of you remember, where over 800 people died <coughs> in a span of two or three weeks. Now, Heat waves are predicted to be more intense and more frequent as time goes on within a system. And it has a serious impact on several different things that you all probably care about. The first of which is public health. People dying is obviously very serious and something that we want to um, prevent. But there are much less tangible impacts that you see also, including increased energy use, um, decreased air quality. Because the higher the temperatures, the more uh, smog you get in local communities, and that again has an impact on public health, including uh, kids with asthma, people with chronic respiratory conditions, and there's a lot more people sick in the hospital. And it's compounded, at least in some of your larger cities in Minnesota, by something called the urban heat island effect. Um, I apologize for those of you on the phone, but for those of you in the room, who's heard that term before? Okay, great. So this is pretty. The uh, savvy audience with respect to heat island. Um, it's a phenomenon where cities are just hotter than surrounding areas. I'm sure everybody who comes into Minneapolis and St. Paul daily is familiar. Um, what you might not know, and I, I stole this graphic from Kurt Shipton at the Global Cool Cities Alliance, I should give him credit, is that Minnesota, Minneapolis, has one of the most intense urban heat islands in the country. Right now. Not with climate change taken into account, not 20 years from now, right now. Um, and it's in fact an average of 4.3 degrees hotter than the surrounding area. So, again, something that is a current condition that's just going to get exacerbated by some of the climate protection we <coughs> think about. Um, and this graphic from EPA from 2006 uh, is projecting out how many more people per 100,000 are projected to die annually from heat-related causes. So again, um, you've got Minneapolis at 2.32 per 100,000 per year. Now, it may not sound like a ton, uh, but presumably any more deaths than to prevent is too many. So what are you going to do about it, right? You've got hotter cities, um, got increased urban heat island from increased temperatures, you've got people Going into the hospital night, you've got increased energy, you've got decreased air quality and water quality, and all kinds of things that none of us really are super excited about. So one thing you can do is put cool rooms on buildings, um, which is essentially, at its most simple, 
including just a light colored coating on the roof of the building. This reflects the sun's energy and keeps both the interior of the building cooler uh, and the surrounding air temperatures cooler as well. Um, and in 2013, the Los Angeles City Council passed an ordinance requiring all new residential construction to have a cooler. Um, does it sound really ambitious? It's because it is. Uh, it's one of the first of its kind. Um, however, for those of you who are maybe inclined to say, oh God, well that's California. That's crazy. That's crazy. We can't possibly do that. Um, Dallas, in fact, has a similar green building ordinance that requires all, at least commercial buildings over a certain size to have cool roofs. Um, no exceptions. So, um, Maybe all residential construction is a little ambitious, but there are certainly things to think about that might be slightly different than that. Um, also, for those of you from cities where roofs don't generally look like this, um, I wanted to just point out also that coolers come in all kinds now. Um, many cases, they look exactly like a traditional roof. And so, for communities where aesthetics might be an issue, where single family homes frankly don't have flat roofs, um, there are all kinds of options out there. Yeah, these things cooler. So green roofs also, um, green roofs are really, really popular right now in a lot of places that have both heat islands and stormwater management problems, which, yes, is people's room. Um, this is a city of, uh, picture the city of Chicago's city hall. Put a green roof on their city hall a number of years ago, and this infrared picture over here on the side. Um, you can see the city. Wrong, funny, sorry about that. Um, the city roof right here, and the county roof next door, which is just a traditional blacktop roof. Um, so 75 degree difference between the two roofs on a 90 degree day. Um, now I should give the county a little bit of credit since this photo became somewhat infamous. <laughs> they put a cool roof on. Um, it's now much cooler, but I'm not sure of that. So my apologies to the county, to Cook County. Um, but still, the, the difference is pretty dramatic. Um, I also wanted to just point out that we're going to talk about your building codes in a moment. Um, there are many things that local governments can do that don't require code changes as well, including things that you can do with government-owned properties. And I wanted to highlight um, this particular development from Milwaukee. Um, West Lawn was one of the, maybe the largest public housing development in the state of Wisconsin. Um, it was sort of 60s era, low rise development, a lot of issues. They started redeveloping it about five years ago um, and have incorporated all kinds of green elements, including cool roofs, including bioswales to manage stormwater, including a lot of permeable pavements, including all kinds of really cool stuff that is keeping the community cooler, keeping it from flooding. They put in a great big community garden um, in cooperation with Growing Power, for those of you who know that organization, um, where residents are actually growing food and selling it locally, so it's increasing food access and economic development, all kinds of really cool stuff. Um, this is obviously sort of the Cadillac model of redeveloping public housing. Um, but again, you know, when you are, when you have an opportunity to um, manage your public properties, you don't have to do everything all the time. You can put a cool roof on if you're redoing things that way. You can install some variables if you're doing great right typing. There's all kinds of things that are um, to increase the resilience of those communities. Um, I should say also, I meant to put a slide in here, but I'll just sort of talk about it. Uh, District of Columbia government is currently undergoing programs, they're calling their smart roof program. Um, they did a survey, she did a hiring consultant to do a survey uh, of, I don't know, some number of hundred groups of government-owned buildings in the district. Uh, and evaluate those groups for the potential to put either a cool roof, a green roof, or solar roof. They now have this great big spreadsheet and this sort of strategic plan, basically, um, for 140 of their roofs, and they prioritize to make up a number, it's about 20, to do right now. A handful of cool roofs, a handful of combined green and solar, and a handful of solar. Because their buildings they were planning to renovate anyway, they assessed the potential uh, to get either cooling, stormwater management, or energy generation out of each, and they're making it happen. Uh, it's actually 
variable project, and I can share information on that thing like this. But. So last, what does all this do? We talked a little bit about projections of heat-related mortality, right? Um, Global Pool Cities Alliance did a really cool study that uh, I also can share, uh, looking at D.C., L.A., and New York City. So if they were to increase uh, receptivity, albedo, uh, and vegetation by 10% <laughs> in their heat island, they cut outside temperatures by less than a degree Fahrenheit. And that doesn't sound like a lot, right? Actually, it turns out to be kind of a lot. Um, DC can get a 7% mortality reduction if they deploy um, this 10% in the right places, which they have now mapped out and identified, where the city is the hottest and where the people are the most vulnerable. Um, you can actually get New York City a 0.3 degree Fahrenheit reduction if you have a 9% mortality reduction during the heat. That's pretty extraordinary. Um, those numbers are obviously, I think, a little bit bigger just because of how densely New York is populated. So reduction in temperature in smaller areas is going to get you more public health benefits. However, um, I think the principle holds. It's really pretty astounding. So back to flooding. I talked a lot about it. I want to talk a little bit about flooding. Um, Minnesota is projected to get more rainfall, but it's not just more rainfall. It's more rainfall in a totally different pattern. And that's what things get a little funky. So more rainfall in the spring, and those uh, precipitation events, as they call them in on that plan, are, are projected to be both just more intense generally. So not just sort of more rain every day, but more intense rain all at once, which is, of course, a funny problem. And this is Carlton, Minnesota, back in June 2012, and you all had all those terrible floods. Um, so on one hand, severe flooding is going to be terrible for your buildings. Um, it also may end up having some impact on the economy in Minnesota, given agriculture. Uh, spring planting may end up being delayed, and that's going to have some pretty serious health and health effects, I think, on the state. Um, interestingly, in summertime, you're actually projected to get less rain. So again, agriculture could be interesting around here. We'll have to make some changes. And I'm in absolutely no way an expert on climate adaptation in agriculture. Um, luckily, you've got some great people working in the state that are. This is one from Duluth in June 2012. So, what do building codes have to do with any of this? I've been talking about impacts. I've been talking about sort of what the world will look like. What does it all mean for buildings, right? So, this is a schematic from a New York City report from, I think, about two years ago uh, on building resiliency and their codes. And they identified a whole suite of things. Uh, and this is for single-family homes, clearly, which I thought might be most relevant for most of you. Um, thinking about ways to make them more resilient to <laughs> climate impacts. Now, those that are concerned with sea level rise, you also have to get over. One impact you also have. <laughs> don't have to worry about. Um, but those dealing with heat, I think, are, are frankly highly relevant. So we've got cool roofs. We've got insulated walls, um, both to keep more heat in in the winter and to keep heat out. Uh, we've got to think about what kind of trees you're going to plant from now on because average lifespan of a tree is a whole lot longer than we've got reliable climate data and you want them to be viable as raising mature trees providing all of the benefits that trees provide four years from now. Uh, and your climate is going to look entirely different. You've got to think about whether planting the same trees that have been native to Minnesota in the past are still going to to be viable when things are hotter and drier in summer and hotter and wetter other parts of the year. Um, in terms of stormwater management, you guys can have a lot of water coming all at once. Um, everybody's got stormwater management problems to start with. So, we need to think about with that. We're talking about permeable pavement. We're talking about decreasing just the amount of pavement generally given the opportunity. We're talking about um, sewage valves to keep sewage from backing up into basements when things start to overflow. Do you all have any combined sewer systems in Minnesota? That's good. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> One big problem you don't have to worry about, too. Um, and then sloping sidewalks and tree sets to be able to shoot 
channel runoff where you want to go. Um, also, have to think about things like, in terms of thinking ahead, you may have to think about the way that you traditionally size heating and cooling systems for buildings, taking particular assumptions about a number of heating degree days and cooling degree days into account. Again, over the lifespan of the building, those may not be the same at the end of the lifespan as they even are now or have been historically. So lots of things to think about in terms of not only sort of code changes, but regular practice, I think, in building design. Brings us to code generally. Um, again, as I'm sure all of you know better than I do, the state building code does not like the building code to be different, right? Um, this is not unique, but it's one model among many that we see around the country. Um, currently, geological conditions uh, are the only conditions that warrant local code being any different. Um, and so you may be kind of thinking through, all right, I just showed you all the things you can do with the code. What am I supposed to do with this? I can't do any of this. So, a couple of answers to that, and I don't have all the answers. Um, but some of the research that we did with, together with Laura and NCCA suggests that there are some things that you can do now. Um, things that are mandatory, not so much. Things that are incentive, so things like development incentives, tax incentives, um, setting up energy benchmarking programs. There are things you can do around the edges, at least, um, to start changing behavior. Um, and then you can build in code, frankly. Um, we also did a little bit of work, I should mention, looking at other states that had building codes different from Minnesota uh, to see whether there might be a model that's just a tiny bit more flexible than Minnesota, um, that Minnesota might be able to adopt. Everybody wanted to see. Uh, so we looked at Washington State, we looked at California, Pennsylvania, we looked at um, Massachusetts, uh, I looked at Maryland because that's where I live, uh, and the District of Columbia, and there's a whole spectrum of state control that other states provide, from uh, Massachusetts where the local governments can apply to the state for permission to make something different based on climactic and other types of conditions, topological, um, to California and Pennsylvania, which are quite similar, um, and in particular spaces, um, and Pennsylvania is quite protective of its residential code, um, but in particular <laughs> spaces, and um, notify the state that they're making a change to their local code, and the state can then sort of deny it uh, if it doesn't think that the action is reasonably justified. Um, to Maryland, where, I, I don't think probably fly around here, but Maryland is the one. Go, go forth and make code. You know, here's your state code, but if you choose to make a difference, go ahead. Um, so it's interesting. You end up with a pretty wide swath of building code changes. The only two that in Maryland were not allowed to change are the accessibility code. Uh, and I'm clicking on what that will look up in a minute. Um, I think it's by your code. So, the, you know, pretty basic. Please. Yeah, when you say they're allowed to change, is, it, is that only in the direction of making it more stringent? Ah, what a great question. I'm so glad you asked that because I meant to say, in all of these cases, you can only make more stringent. The state code is at the very least the floor. You can't undermine it. You can't undermine it anyway. Thank you. That's a really important point. Thank you for asking that. Um, in all of the states that I just talked about, the state code is the floor. And any changes have to be more stringent and, and justified for a good reason. You know, the local climate conditions, local geological conditions, etc. Uh, sometimes, I think in Pennsylvania, you can also have public health and safety conditions. Hi. So there's a question about this on the webinar. Actually. Yes. So I guess just, uh, I think you've already hit on it, but so Minnesota cities can make their codes more restrictive, but they could be um, kind of denied by the state. In Minnesota? Yeah. No, I'm sorry, I should have been more clear. So in Minnesota, Local government codes are precluded entirely for making their codes different than the state code, um, for, except for local geological conditions. Um, and if anybody has actually done that, I would love to hear what that looks like. I couldn't find any. Um, my guess is at least rare. Um, so yeah, that, that's a great clarifying question. So currently, the state law in Minnesota is no, has to be the same as the state code. 
not so much on local versus state. I would I would say that the state code ought to be beefed up immensely for energy conservation and do it do it now. Yeah. So that would certainly be one model to make the state code stronger and have it apply to everybody. Um, and that would certainly get some of the energy efficiency questions. Absolutely. Um, in terms of sort of local flooding conditions and local urban heat island conditions, it may not quite get there as well. Um, and this isn't necessarily an either or. Also, you could both beef up the state code and potentially provide some kind of flexibility for the locality um, along that spectrum of state versus local control that I talked about in the other states. I don't think you guys do in Maryland. But maybe you still in Massachusetts. And would that be helpful? Yeah, we sort of dealt with the premise that it might be, but I'm curious to see whether our premise is right. Uh, so Kurt Schultz of the city of St. Paul, not representing the city in these <laughs> comments. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, I work with the sustainable building policy for the city. And the only way that we're able to require something greater than what code allows is by investing, having a, uh, a carrot, yep. an incentive in the program. Well, it would be nice if we could expand those, that initiative more broadly, but we're not able to at this point. So personally, I think it would be nice if we could have uh, flex codes or stretch, code. stretch codes uh, that uh, not only with regard to resilience, but with regard to mitigation as well. That's helpful. Thank you. Laura? Yeah. Sarah, maybe you could just talk a little about the a couple models, both for statutory tweaks potentially or for a stretch code that you've researched. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, in terms of what would a state code here? Look like if it were if it were not as it is now. Um, the state building code statute that keeps all of you from doing anything different um, essentially says local codes shall not be different than the state code um, except in cases of local geological conditions. And I think I've got that basically right. Might not be exactly right. Um, so one of the simplest changes might be to simply add climatological, geological, or topographical um, to increase the suite of local conditions that might warrant local code being different. Um, so under that current construction, um, interestingly, even though the code change is very small, you'd add, what, two words or four words, it actually gives you a ton more flexibility than some of the models that I talked about because it wouldn't necessarily be asking permission to do it. Um, and, and you often talk with the state folks about what they do okay with that. Um, but setting up some kind of a structure whereby you have some flexibility with some level of state control, either getting permission up front or with a notification and then they can deny it if they don't think you have enough evidence. On the back end, um, that kind of thing, I think, uh, would certainly result in more flexibility. Um, in terms of stretch code, um, there are a lot of places now who are doing stretch code, uh, including Massachusetts that I talked about earlier. They've got an energy stretch code that um, is optional. Um, cities can either choose to meet at the base, then they do ICC codes. It's um, IACC 2012, I think they've currently adopted, um, and they've got a stretch code that goes. Yeah, the cities can choose to enforce if they want. Um, so again, in Minnesota, if they were to adopt some kind of stretch code, it would at least give you a choice of options um, that would be allowed. Does that make sense? Please. A couple things. Um, This is just personal personal observation. You see these big home big homes going up. Everybody wants their own McMansion. Yeah. Yet they don't have better codes. And then another comment: um, we've got a, a Minneapolis-St. Paul. There's so many many older homes, and 
how do we deal with codes on existing homes? And then it's a third quick thing here. If one city starts doing something gung-ho, are they going to potentially drive business away and, you know, a developer isn't going to want to come into a city that's got extremely strong codes and so they just don't build there? Right. So that raises a whole bunch of important issues all at once. Um, so I'm going to take the last two first, if that's okay. Um, so in terms of existing buildings, obviously this is tricky. Um, and rehabilitation codes will get to existing buildings if there's big renovation going on. But otherwise, not so much, right? Um, and that's where some of the incentive-based tools can come in. Um, so code for new, new construction and you know, sort of big renovations on existing buildings. But to get to those existing buildings, that is really the tricky part. Um, and I think that's where some of the incentive-based pieces can come in. Um, and I think sort of a full suite might try to get to um, both new and existing simultaneously. Um, in terms of the big mansion. Um, you know, in the DC area, we have plenty of those too. I think that's sort of all over the place. Um, and in terms of <laughs> driving developers out, so it's tricky, right? Um, we hear that a lot of places, and a lot of it is also dependent on how good the local economy is. Starva. Um, if the local economy is strong and there's enough demand, developers are going to build there even if the codes are stronger. And if there's not, they're not. Um, so there's sort of an interesting back and forth. Um, I can say that in the D.C. area where we've got D.C., Maryland, Virginia, all with different codes, each county in Maryland now has its own code. Some of the towns have their own codes. Um, we see plenty of development even in places where codes are stronger, but again, the economy is strong. So I think it's both sort of true that you have to think about driving the developers out, but it's a little more complicated than that. Also. Yeah, thanks. Are there any on the no. Great. Last question. Um, so it's a two two questions. One. Um, so what's the argument against allowing local stretch codes? Why would why would a state even stretch codes particularly? Yeah. And then yeah. So let's just go with that question. <laughs> I mean, it seems like sort of a silly thing. But. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
Well, thank you, all of you. Um, I'm happy to chat with anybody after this about any of these things. And I've got some resources I can share on particular issues for anybody who's interested. Thank you. So um, this is the link on the PCA website for um, Sarah's report. Um, it's a tiny URL if you want to use that one. Um, and the the whole webinar will be online, so you can just look it up later. So um, as I mentioned, uh, Doug and I go way back for a very long time. Doug was chairing the American Institute of Architects Committee on the Environment. Um, and doing a special regenerative building project that a bunch of us, Tim Nolan and I from NBC and a bunch of other people were involved in. And so um, I just sent a call to Doug to see how, what kind of opportunities there were to get Sarah to present around here. And so now here we are talking about the Resiliency Action List. Doug is a senior associate with Perkins & Well, a uh, Minneapolis architectural firm that works internationally, um, and a member of the Area Research Board, Steering Committee Area Research is the way that more interesting uh, research um, on resilient design. Um, his, he has work all over the world, but his local work includes the Wild River Center, the Lake Gold Center, and the Great River Energy Headquarters, which is Lake Platinum. And uh, as Sarah's mentioned, he's now pioneering uh, sustainability for the D.C. area. Uh, he chairs the National Resiliency Initiative at the Institute for Market Transformation to Sustainability, MPS. Uh, and that's where he led the development of RELY, which is a validated uh, consensus uh, ANSI standard uh, designed nationally. Uh, he serves on the University of Minnesota College of Architecture Sustainability Faculty. So please welcome Doug Kirk. Thank you. Well, thank you. Laura, thanks so much for a spot. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, a great introduction. Actually, I have a handout to pass around. This is really more just to help you follow along with some things. So I'm going to start that out right here with David and just let him pass that around. Um, so, uh, you know, I realized in putting this presentation together, it was yesterday, I realized that um, it was 30 years ago this week that I graduated from architecture school and my thesis was on uh, sustainability. <laughs> so it's since then, I've actually, I'm now updating my thesis that they made. And we're sort of updating to resiliency. And um, the, uh, that update is actually being driven by uh, three sort of sources of information. One is uh, 30 years of practice doing green buildings. And as Laura was saying, some of you recognize these projects that have been involved with Great River Energy, which is the first lead platinum. Uh, the Wilder Center, which was one of the first lead gold projects. And then on the far right is actually a cut section of the renovation for the St. Louis County Government Service Center, which is headed for a lead platinum certification as well. Um, so the information I'm going to show you is driven through that lens, practice. It's also driven through the lens of teaching. So I'm pulling forward uh, some collateral and materials that we've been working with for almost a decade uh, at the Sustainable Design Graduate Program at the University of Minnesota. And then there's also a collective of individuals around the country that have engaged in this work. And it really brackets about 10 years worth of work off and on through a variety of people. And then about a year of very intense work uh, starting last May. So uh, I have about 70 minutes worth of slides in about 50 minutes. So I'm actually going to have to skip through some slides. I'm going to try and pick, pick that as we go. So what I've got lined up is uh, understanding resiliency, first off, to give some framing for that. Then kind of a cut through the resiliency action list at a higher level. And actually, that ties to another standard called the Green and Resilient Finance. Those two things act interactively. Then I'm going to circle back a little bit around to why, what, what are some of the challenges. And, and Sarah did a really nice job of touching on that earlier. Uh, and then if there's time, I want to go through and sample some of the credits and the prerequisites that are in RELY. Um, there's almost 200 of them, so I can only sample. 
And I'll talk about why this is 200. So, uh, kind of looking at resilience, it's actually a much bigger framework than that. And the Rockefeller Foundation has been doing quite a bit of work on it. They're hitting it through climate change, but they're really focused on social cohesion as much as anything. So they, they have four dimensions uh, that they're working with. And it starts with health and well-being, uh, economy and society, infrastructure and environment, and leadership and strategy. So I was really happy to see them thinking about it in this terms and to have an organization like Rockefeller talking about the breadth and depth of the topic instead of narrowing it so tightly. So this has been an important sort of perspective that we've taken in developing RELY. And then there's some other drivers that we put together early uh, resiliency should have in the design community. So these are the basic drivers that we looked at as we, as we started putting together criteria. Um, building the community should be shock resistant, healthy, it should be adaptable and regenerative. And that's through a combination of diversity, foresight and the capacity for self-organization and learning. So through those drivers, we said, how can we as architects and designers and builders actually influence some of these things? And what's it mean for the built environment to do that? So a little bit of a focus to sustainability, because I get this question all the time. What is the difference between sustainability and resilience. So this is a really short and extremely abbreviated response. This is kind of the elevator response. Is that sustainability kind of framed around, was framed somewhat around the future. And it was saying that our future is at, is at risk and we need to mitigate and do some adaptation uh, to improve the future. So resiliency shifts the lens a little bit. It says, well, the future that we were somewhat concerned about, issues of climate change, et cetera, have actually arrived, they're here. Um, and now we really need to also start to adapt to those changes, but we need to continue to mitigate uh, the worst impacts because the impacts we don't mitigate will go beyond our capacity to adapt. So we can't, now we're doubly tasked with what we need to do. So that's a really simple sort of framework. And then for the uh, academics in the room, um, Richard's here, John's here, et cetera, kind of thing. Um, you can sort of look at the approach we've been taking to green design and, and through the lens of ecological design. And I like to think of that as living design because ecological design is such a wonky big word. Just living design rolls so much easier off the top. So if you kind of take a look at that, generally there's about four or five frames that everybody talks about. Resiliency, restoration, regeneration, sustainability, and wellness. So if you bundle those all together, you sort of get the full lens of it. That is that resiliency is the framework. Restoration is about repair, constructing and producing. Sustainability is lasting, and wellness is health. So if you bring all those attributes together, you get start to get a composite picture of what ecological or living design is and what we're really trying to do. So basically, uh, the way that we started with these lenses on resiliency. So that's kind of, here's some crossover examples of how things come together. And I focus on this because I was actually in D.C. at a sort of round table meeting that included <coughs> EPA and FEMA and uh, NIST and Homeland Security and a whole variety of people. And I brought up the idea that energy efficiency was part of resiliency. And I got sort of jumped on it. That, no, that's not part of resiliency. And I was like, what? So um, it, it, that sort of drove a whole idea to me that we need to really talk about why that is. So I did some crossover examples anyway. If people are questioning what's the difference between sustainability, how are they related, et cetera. Um, so sustainability and resiliency. So, and this was actually the example I gave for this sort of response that I had got. And that wasn't everyone in the room, by the way. It was just a, a few people. Uh, you know, energy efficiency is really important if you're going to try and do backup generation during an emergency. If you have a building that's more energy efficient, you don't need as much fuel for your backup system. Or if you have the same quantity of fuel, you can basically run the generator longer. You can actually have longer terms of resiliency. So efficiency is a fundamental aspect of resiliency. Um, oops, back went, went too far. Stormwater infiltration. 
So that's a uh, seems like a sustainability topic. It's actually very important to resiliency. Uh, California is a really good example. And NASA is saying that California is going to be completely on groundwater by the end of the year. Ten years ago, they were totally using surface water. So they need to actually recharge their aquifers. So stormwater infiltration is a deep form of resiliency. And here's one that's maybe even more indirect. In November, it was fully approved in December 2000. So the image on the slide is actually one of the flyers that we sent out. We sent out 6,500 emails around the country to people that we thought would be affected by uh, Rely. We looked for comments, uh, public comments. We received public comments. We talked to experts, et cetera. And um, it was fully valid. Uh, the, the nice thing about a consensus standard is that it's referenceable by governments. Um, and because it's consensus, it's a very democratic process, and that avoids uh, constrained trade issues that you can run into when you're putting together standards. So that's an important component of this. And the process was administered by the Capital Markets Partnership, uh, NBC, and MTF. Uh, folks that were involved with that were very involved with putting together the and the initial development of that standard. Um, and basically, the standard will be available at the AMSI store in about 20 years. And then it all, along with campus growth, it's focused mostly around new construction, but it's also applicable to existing buildings. And I think uh, we've had some conversations with uh, USGBC LA. Um, they called us, actually. And they're kind of looking at existing buildings as a, as a lens. So they were thinking in very similar terms uh, as, to, as to what Rely is. And uh, so they were excited, actually, to see that we'd already done some work. And they sort of hopefully we can collaborate and move forward with that with uh, a collaboration. Design, sort of all at the same time. 
and it's intentionally similar to lead for ease of update. So you'll see language and then we try to tie it very strongly to financing, regional economics, and other social indicators. So that's part of its comprehensive sort of nature. Really make those tangible. How do they become real in the built environment? What do you do with those things? So we set it up as full preparedness, hazard adaptation, and mitigation. Um, those are the sort of buckets that everybody thinks of as resiliency. Then there's community vitality. That's the social cohesion piece of it. Productivity, health, and diversity. And the diversity covers everything from ecological to human diversity, ecological to human health, et cetera. Then there are those classic sustainability components of energy and water and materials and artifacts. And then the last one is applied creativity, which is really similar to foundation. So the top group approach has a preparedness and resiliency. The resiliency, but there's clear overlaps with sustainability and all the other things. So where we're at right now, we're really in a pilot phase. And we're looking for folks that want to engage in pilot projects. So the, some of the goals we have for the pilot phase is actually different press. We don't have a point system set up. We have ideas for how that'll work. The other thing we want to do is develop prototypical credit bundles. We talk about 200 different credits. That's a lot to swim in. So what we actually uh, plan to do are set up prepackaged sort of bundles that you can start from. You can add or subtract from those bundles. You're not locked into them. That, that will give everybody a place to start. And that's actually, that concept and approach is how we've been applying this at uh, the University uh, of Minnesota College of Architecture and Design, that type of approach. And it's been working pretty good. So um, we think that's the way, one way to start to deal with the comprehensive nature of what we need to do. So we now it's here. And we set up an incubator for community engagement. So people can engage online. It's basically a blog where we can post credits, get interpretations, and engage the community. Um, you can engage through Twitter. Um, actually, if you just hashtag C3 incubator, um, that will connect back to our incubator page. And then also in person, uh, we're doing bi monthly work with AIA Minnesota Coast. And Hopefully, we can engage with USGBT in the summer as well. So that's kind of who developers and people from building. So I actually can respond to that question in very tangible ways with the uh, finance team. Um, so I'll play that out a little bit with these slides. So it's technically rely on an amendment to the green building underwriting our investment underwriting standard. So that was created in 2008. It was updated in 2012. Um, and in, this is in that realm more than it is in design. Um, and it's taken me a couple of years to actually get my wheels on around this idea. But now that I have it, it's like, yeah, this is pretty powerful to set post stuff. So uh, the green, to put this in perspective, the global green bonds market started at about 11 billion in 2013. It's expected to hit 100 billion this year and likely to just keep escalating. So uh, the, uh, you know, if there's failure in other policy areas the, around dealing with climate change at a large scale, um, hopefully the markets can pick up the space. And the idea here is to catalyze the markets in a big way with the standard. And the way it really Oh, uh, and there are paths actually besides rely that allow you to use this financing standard. Um, you can use Energy Star, Lead, Literally Challenge, IGCC. Actually, this, our, our local codes will work in terms of SB 2030 and B3. Uh, those are all part of the green components for sure that can apply to the financing standard and underpin it. Um, and also, you can use Rely for the resiliency. And essentially, there are 20 green and resilient actions identified in the standard. 
um, that are technically considered to be tangible. So that's the legal frame for what they are. I think of them as direct value. So these there's 20 items that go straight to the bottom line of getting financing, the value of properties, uh, the fundamental working aspects of organizations. And the way the standard works is it's designed to put a value on those attributes, green, resilient, and by the bond that it's set up for. And what happens is you basically sell more bond or you put more money out into the world, but your administrative costs stay the same. That's the way I understand it. Sarah has a little look on her eyes like it might be different. <laughs> well, if you have a uh, good question, so if you have, let's say you have a hundred, let's say you have a six hundred million dollar bond. Uh, Bank of America just issued a six hundred million dollar green bond like two days ago or so. Um, and if it oversubscribes, and there's a cost to administer that and put it out, which is not cheap actually, putting bonds out is not always cheap. So there's so many people that want to buy into it. And I don't know about that bond, but it, historically, let's say there's a you know, six hundred million dollar bond and you. $750 million worth of people want to buy into it. You can actually issue $750 million, but the cost of administration fundamentally stays the same. So the cost of the money goes down to the bond. So that's the whole idea behind the standard is to make <coughs> finance, the finance side uh, and capital costs for projects cheaper to move the markets and to drive investment into this. The other thing that's happening, and this comes to the code side. The uh, Standards and Poor, the rating agency that we're all familiar with, that rates cities and companies, governments, entire countries for their credit worthiness, is now downgrading countries, cities, locations based on their climate vulnerability. So they've got 161 countries that they come out and rank. Um, I know that at the bottom of the list, the most vulnerable is Cambodia. Uh, the U.S. is fairly high. We're in pretty good shape because we have a lot of money, so we can adapt. Um, but Standard & Poor's is now looking at, I'll repeat that, downgrading the credit worthiness of countries, cities, et cetera, based on their vulnerability. So what that means is you can't, you, can't, you may not hold a AAA rating. St. Paul has a AAA rating, as I understand it. So, you know, and sometime in the future, and I'm not suggesting they can't hold this, but I'm just using it as an example. <laughs> Standard Poor's might come along and say, you know what, you've got things going on in your city that aren't really dealing with climate vulnerability and we're going to have to downgrade. So that means the cost of our country for that institution or that city or that country as well. So this is really a big market driver kind of component. And so from a development standpoint, there's a big difference in resiliency compared to just sort of doing things that maybe are the right thing to do. You can actually, if you're a city and you're not keeping up with climate change, you can actually start to impact your capacity to borrow money or the cost of borrowing. Um, if you're a developer, um, you can actually get cheaper money by doing resiliency factors. So that's, this kind of starts to reverse the whole equation of, you know, not chasing after doing uh, more intense things relative to resiliency. It's no longer just a cost that people start to add on, even though there are all the savings around operation, all the savings around productivity, which were huge, this adds a whole other dimension to that of why you would do these things. Also, um, it helps to maintain your property values over time. Your projects will stay salient longer. Uh, green buildings are have a higher market value now, and they're going to stay at a higher level for an extended period of time. You can also reduce your insurance rates. So if you have, these, this gets down to those really basic things like wind resistance, uh, rainwater, stormwater events, uh, flood, all those kinds of things. Well, if you build out correctly, you can actually start to reduce your insurance rates. So there's real dollars attached to taking these actions. So to sort of summarize that, Investor risks and reduce risk to the bottom line because that's what the finance community is really interested in is reducing risk. It took me a while to figure that out, but that's where they're at. So, 
So you can basically reduce physical damage to buildings. Um, you can continue there's business continuity issues that are involved, so that actually improves your credit worthiness if you can show that your business can stay intact. Long-term project value and a reduced regulatory risk. I know there's a lot in the slide to the financing standard, and they're all part of Rely. A lot of these actually, once again, you can get through LEED, you can get through Living Building Challenge, other things, and the uh, financing standard directly references LEED as an example of one of the ways to basically <coughs> credential what you're doing. So it also references Rely. Uh, you can use, once again, you can use SB 2030 and B3 to credential what you're up to. So this is a long list. Um, you know, there's items under each one of the, the main realms. Uh, things like, I'm not going to go through all of them because you can reference this, but things like backup power and access to backup power. Um, first aid and communications, just to deal with immediate crisis. Food, potable water. These have to do with business continuity, so there's a reduced risk. Um, avoiding the floodplains, baseline for a lie is being out of a 500 year floodplain or preparing for floods at the 500 year level. By the way, the federal government is now referencing that as well, 500 year floodplain. So, Sean, that starts to get a little bit to what you're talking about. Now, we have some other things too. Safer design for extreme weather, wildfire, fire, and seismic events. These are all covered under the fortified standard and which you reference, extreme stormwater and flood management. So we have a credit for extreme uh, stormwater that builds off of historical data uh, relative to the increase in precipitation. And basically it says to take the past uh, 30, 40 years of data, starting in uh, 1950, there's really good data on uh, precipitation amounts all the way through about 2010, I believe, something on that order. <laughs> and for Minnesota, that means we've had we've actually had a 37 percent increase in extreme rain events. So the way the credit in Rely works is it says just extend that linear for 30 years. Not very sophisticated, but very understandable. It's a metric. It's not prescriptive. Take what's been happening and extend it. And then we can have really great debates about whether that's adequate or not. <laughs> um, and that's part of, actually, it's one of the great things about standards and the democratic process of making standards is people can voice their opinions and we can change it if we need to. Or, you know, the dramatic change that has to be revalidated and all those kinds of things. Or we can create innovation credits that elevate. Uh, transit and transportation connectivity are all part of this fundamental package. Uh, being connected to transit increases your long-term value. It also increases resiliency because people can get to work or they can uh, access the site, etc. Um, then there's things like protecting wetlands, avoiding uh, steep slopes, etc. Protecting wetlands is kind of a big picture topic. Um, it's really good for resiliency relative to flooding. Um, it's also good from a regulatory standpoint because if you're protecting wetlands, you have less chance that you're breaking regulatory rules. So that's actually a risk reduction factor for business. Um, resilient food production on site, urban agriculture, those kinds of things helps with business continuity. Here's one that may sound like an outlier. It's using legally logged wood. So that's actually a regulatory risk. That's really minor except that if you actually look at the federal law on it's called the Lacey Act, um, if you're bringing in exotic uh, sort of elements into the country, all kinds of things. This actually started with birds back in 1910. Um, there's actually criminal obligations relative to that. So there are major issues with that topic. So there's actually a regulatory risk issue here if you're dealing with a lot of wood. If you're doing using legally, illegally logged wood. Pesticides and herbicides, same kind of thing. Around staying away from the regulatory impacts of that. And then there's a whole series under uh, that you would think of as green uh, density and connectivity. Those are fundamentally social cohesion topics. And they create social cohesion and the capacity. If you remember, we talked about self organizing. 
uh, and learning. Uh, the self-organizing capacity is really critical in moments of crisis. People need to come together and work to uh, resolve the crisis situation. Government can only do so much. The emergency responders can only do so much in a really serious situation. So connectivity, basic things like sidewalk, uh, visiting the same restaurant so you get to know your neighbors. They sound really mundane. They're actually really important kinds of topics. The island effects, Sarah did a great job of talking about that and why. Uh, water efficient landscaping, water use reduction. Um, if you're in California right now, I'm pretty sure your property values would be a lot better if you weren't using a lot of water. Um, energy efficiency, on-site renewable energy, same kinds of topics, and then all the classic indoor environmental quality components. Those all add long-term and lasting value to buildings and productivity. So one of the things that happens here with the, the standard is that uh, the local institutions, whoever you're talking to in terms of your finance, established the standard just sets up the framework part. And to have some. So, on that standard, um, a whole slip off the end. I want to shift just a little bit onto what are we adapting to? What are the what are the drivers? So there's some mega trends that are occurring, and actually uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers identified these mega trends. And this is from demographic and social change. Uh, the population, I'll tie this back to Minnesota, is becoming more diverse. So there are actually credits in Rely that help to provide better social cohesion. Um, are diverse populations. So to help that occur. Uh, shifting economic power, uh, China is actually now, in terms of real economic size, China has exceeded the US, have a bigger economy than we do. It doesn't show up in the charts and graphs because we end up with a lot of their products, but actually China has a bigger economy. So that's shifting the balance of, of uh, product flow, et cetera, it's putting a lot of pressure on local economies. So there are credits in Rely that focus heavily on local economics to try to bolster that as part of a resiliency. And then, of course, climate change and resource scarcity, which is why we're actually all in this room. Um, basically, PwC is saying heavy weather, water crisis, and carbon pressure and fossil fuels is going to be an important component. Things we've been talking about for years. Uh, but this is the financial. This is the World Economic Forum's discussion on what kinds of issues the world is going to be facing. And uh, they just met in Davos uh, two months ago. World leaders from France, Germany, uh, our Secretary of State, Kerry, was there, et cetera. These are definitely uh, you know, the leadership in the developed world and other components. They basically have a, uh, did a survey of 896 global leaders, mostly from business. And they ranked uh, issues on the order of impact, which is up on the scale, and likelihood, which is across the bottom. So if you just take the components that are sort of in the upper right-hand quadrant, which means they are pretty likely to have some likelihood of impact, the things that rise to the surface is one of the ones that are at the top of the global leaders and businesses are concerned. I understand conflict is there too. A failure very high on the list. Well, I'm concerned, you know, we're not going to actually do that. Unemployment and unemployment and extreme weather risk. So these are the crisis issues identified by the World Economic Forum kind of at the top of the list. All the kinds of things we're talking about. Um, so everybody's getting on board with this concept that we need to do something. This graph is from Standard & Poor's. It's really showing the change of extreme weather events. So across the bottom in red is earthquakes. You can see earthquakes have stayed pretty constant since 1980. That's not being impacted by climate change. You can watch all the other events get greater and greater and greater. Extreme temperatures are on the rise, flooding, mass movement of water, tropical storms. You can just watch them increase across the course of time. So 
Um, this isn't projecting into the future, this is just mapping. So you can watch the future and see what's going to happen in the future. So it's showing weather for exercise rain. I think a lot of us may be up that they considered it absolutely essential from a business continuity standpoint and regaining the trust of their constituents. Uh, Atlanta recently had their ice again. Boston just went through snow again. And Australia is hitting record heat. Right? Those are these are the topics, and these are all in most ways apply to us. Um, Minnesota, our issues are flood, hail, wildfire. Um, there are actually some recent studies that indicate that the number of tornadoes across the year are But outbursts of tornadoes where they sort of outbreaks in the mass number at one time is greatly on the increase. So you you know, you could probably watch this in the weather. It's like suddenly there's fifteen tornadoes somewhere. So it's sort of a scale issue. And that looks to be related to climate change and the changing weather. So we can expect that to happen. So I'm going to one or two questions. I just covered a lot of stuff. Oh, oh, on that right note. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, uh, so to sort of flip Diana's response, we have actions that you can take in response to <laughs> you got problems, you got answers. <laughs> Great. Right. Um, so I have a question for the new finance tools kick in just because like for example at Hiawatha Lake where I live we're adding 400 units yeah. um, and if we could get some of the money to make the buildings more efficient now how do I value the 20 years of energy savings? So the financing standard is available now. It's up and rolling. Actually Rely is available now too for anybody that wants to use it. But the financing standard has been in place Actually went into place in 2008 just as the market crash. So everybody lost. No one paid attention. To it. So we're actually, it's coming back. The S and P is very interested in it. This whole process, we're having conversations with S and P. Um, S and P sees this to Diana's point. Rely as the rely plus the financing standard uh, is seen as a way that S and P does not have to continually do downgrades. Right. So you take these actions. And suddenly you're shifting the trajectory of what you're up to. So this is the good news: is that people are recognizing that we can take action and we can do things to adapt and to mitigate. So Sean, the tools are available now. You just have to pick them up and use it. And you have to get your mortgage, uh, your financial people, to agree to it. And it actually was built by a whole series of large banks and a variety of people actually created the state of the art. Um, so the bond market is more ready for it probably than the bank industry. But I think they're all going to pick it up. And when it goes, it's going to go really hard to be over over certainty. All right, so let's do another question. Sorry. Are done better, we save energy, we don't have to rebuild in the case of a storm. That's a good, that's a really good point. And um, so we should add that language into the way I present. <laughs> so that's why I'm here. I'm actually looking for framing. And yeah, I didn't talk about the energy savings piece because we've, from my perspective, we've been talking about that on sustainability for years. So yeah, that's absolutely. That, none of that goes away. The energy savings. Uh, the yeah, fact that you don't have to rebuild is baked right into it if you withstand the storm, that kind of thing. So it's definitely saving and long term mm -hmm. So thanks for pointing that out. I need to add that. There's one on question from the webinar from Terry Gibbs of the Lions for Sustainability. He asked about how or where social justice is incorporated. Ah. Uh, hi, Terry. How are you doing? Um, uh, social justice is an important part. Uh, rely and it's actually in the uh, community vitality component. 
So um, I have some slides on that coming up, but to address that immediately, um, we uh, address it, well, in two places, in the panoramic approach. There's actually uh, sort of studies and business case study components that are part of the early planning process of a building that touches on local economics and a variety of other things, which I would contend are part of economic justice, social justice issues. And then uh, we reference the most three pilot credits that come out in LEED that have to do with social justice issues. You can also utilize the just certification that the NLFI uh, put together. Um, so there's a variety of components in why that address that. There's also a specific credit to Western University around cultural diversity and Western Canada ways to get that. language in your building, uh, providing diversity on boards for organizations and institutions. Um, there's a whole variety of components. I've got a slide on it. I don't have it all memorized off the top of my head. So uh, there's quite a bit. In, and that was one of the things we wanted to deal with as the comprehensive nature of what resiliency is. So I'm going to so go through a few examples. So, I just want to say there are 200 line items, so I, there's no way I can possibly go through this. So I'm just going to kind of pick some things so you get a flavor. So once again, the categories are panoramic approach, hazard preparedness, hazard adaptation mitigation, community vitality, product, productivity, health and diversity, energy and water, materials and artifacts, and applied creativity. And I have some samples from each one of those. So under a panoramic approach, the design of that cuts across. Uh, there's a lot of language on these slides. Part of that is so that people can reference these in the future. This will all be available. Um, some of you can download. So there's a request requirement to do a short-term hazard preparation and mitigation study for your project. And it deals with preparing for and mitigating crisis hazards for buildings in the community. And you have to consider regional and project relevant mm -hmm. issues that are pertinent to your area, you know, whether it's flooding, drought, fire, hazardous material, discordant behavior, which is really civil disobedience, um, epidemics, uh, wildfire, seismic events, we don't have those kinds of issues in Minnesota, uh, storm surge, we don't really have that, or sea level rise, uh, earth and snow slide, and volcanic activity, they're all included in the study. And then there's an integrative process. This is as well. So um, this is all of my approach to your project. Um, and we're calling the, you have to look at redundancy and diversity in terms of what's happening in your project. Uh, energy, water, community, common amenities have to be included in the dialogue as well. So this is part of that social cohesion uh, piece. Um, and at different scales, you include different stakeholders. Get more, basically, the idea is the more inclusive you are, when we get points established, the more points you will get. Basically, an incentive-based approach. Commissioning. So, commissioning is required and a health impact assessment as a credit. So, that basically looks at the economic uh, impact, environment, and equity back to the question on social justice issues. So it's a big social justice topic. Uh, and basically do a study and implement a uh, healthy impact assessment uh, criteria for your project. And then there's actually about four or five credits that are totally focused on integrative process at different levels. The hazard inputs and emergency supplies. So if you want to think about this section, it's not so much about design as it is about operation. There's a whole section on what you do at the operation level. So first off, there's a screen of uh, requisite uh, OSHA requirements, ANC requirements, um, Red Cross, to provide first aid training, uh, CPR training, and 96 hours of emergency supplies, including water and food. So that 96 hours comes from the healthcare standard. And, um, we're really interested in sort of checking that time frame out as we proceed with the pilot. Uh, 
seems really appropriate for hurricanes. Um, I looked at the we looked at the 96 hours, and we looked at some response times. So Katrina, it took three and a half days for the National Guard to get to the Superdome. There were some definitely some things during Sandy that took about three three and a half days to get to certain to certain people, and even longer. So there's a pretty good precedent that. And if you're really going to ride out one of these things, you need about four days worth of stuff. So in Minnesota, we need to think about what that is. Do you need four days? Because it's actually, we don't want to be too onerous. We want people to do these things, not just to live on. Emergency sanitation, that's a big deal, actually. If you're stuck somewhere and the toilets don't flush for four days, that's a problem. So you provide some basic emergency sanitation and communication. Telephone landline, which seems strange, but those are going away. So you got to have something stable, a text messaging, emergency alert radio, and there are options. The telephones, you can have a satellite phone, a CB radio, or a ham radio. Those are all really good, pretty good options. Ham radio may be the best. Um, and then planning for common hazards. Once again, we uh, this is a credit, so this actually amps it up, what we were just talking about. Red Cross has a what's called a ready rating program, so we're saying you have to achieve the strong preparedness component of that. So evacuation plan, mapping hazardous hazardous materials that are around you, um, and if you are within 50 miles of a nuclear reactor, uh, having potassium iodide kits available and, and the methods for using that, and if you're within 20 miles, you have to develop an emergency preparedness plan. And we go on further to say avoid sites that are within 20 miles of a nuclear reactor. So where that came from was looking at Chernobyl and Fukushima and the most intense radioactive plumes from both of those events uh, spewed out about 20 miles. So that's the fundamental framework for that. And the 50 miles is also looking at the radioactive concentrations around both of those events. Uh, risk adaptation is into the field sites. Uh, you can't build below the 500 year flood plan. And if you have to provide flood control mitigation your flood. Then there's sea level rise criteria. Um, it stages in, but uh, just for those that are curious, we top out at, uh, at a five to six foot expected sea level rise. And I was talking with folks from uh, some really uh, excellent scientists, and that's kind of what we arrived at. Storm surge as well. And then backup power, save off of five hundred your flood. Critical facility, operating capacity, deal you know, with basic emergency systems. Fundamental community service organizations, uh, pharmacies, quick service restaurants, this all has to do with basic needs in the time of crisis and that, that sort of uh, self organizing capacity. Uh, you need to be able to do four days, eight hours a day across a four day period. Uh, general retail and commerce, it says you need 16 hours of emergency mode. Um, so it's a couple days, you can spread it out, whatever that means. <clears throat> you know, we've got some green faucets, et cetera, that require power to actually turn on and off. Well, that became a problem in Sandy. Um, and then make sure that, uh, um, you know, toilets and sinks work. Pretty, this is not real glamorous stuff. This is pretty nitty gritty. So I have a few more minutes since I ask, ask a couple questions here. Okay, great. And then uh, dealing with just sort of slide through these. We've already talked about that. A whole variety of say community, um, including library. This is access basically to tuition free. If you would think of it. Uh, so this is back to concepts. And then there's uh, engaged in community related forms of business, forms of stimulating growth and development. Um, interdisciplinary intercultural came up with as part of our life. I mean, one of the ways to do the innovation and pull those in. And those will be somewhat filtered, and part of our goals in pilot is to start to identify appropriate innovation levels. And that's it. <laughs> More sort of actions that you would take to get there. So that actually would be a good sort of tweak. To actually include it. The credit that says keep transit operational. So that's great. That's good. That's a good response. And that's actually part of the pilot phase and the next realm is to we want to gather up these great ideas. We know full well we have not 
captures everything, even with 200 actions, we're not even close. Other questions? Sorry, you got something on, on the phone? Kate Quality had commented earlier that, I mean, in addition to AIA, um, it should be, or you should be working with American Hunting Association. If you that would be great. Right. We, we would love to. Absolutely. I uh, appreciate that response, and our our goal is to be as inclusive and complementary as we can be, um, and to figure out ways to do that. By the way, the uh, the checklist that I handed out and the reference brief that sort of includes all, a lot of this information is uh, it's online. It's free. It's licensed under a Creative Commons license. It's not wide open. Uh, we ask that you not make derivatives of it and send them all around, but it's pretty, I mean, it's a fairly access, it's a pretty accessible document. And then the true standards, uh, the, uh, those will be available, you have to buy those on the ANSI store. There's a lot of information that's available for free um, for everybody, so that's part of our being inclusive. So, so there's, unless anybody else in the room has one, Terry Gibbs had another kind of question and comment. Um, he says that he's a fan and more of your appreciated the cutting edge work and leadership over the years. And he agrees with the concerns raised with the goals, but um, he has concerns about the character um, the characterization of sustainability, which he feels is limited and in a narrow way. Um, something that is not at all what leaders in sustainability, such as the Alliance for Sustainability, have discussed for years. Um, they've always defined, defined sustainability as being ecological sound, economically viable, socially just, humane, embodying our highest values. Um, so, Terry, I, I, I appreciate uh, your thinking and all the really great work that you've been doing for a long time. And um, I don't actually disagree with you. First of all, and um, I have to admit that about five years ago, when uh, all these lenses started popping up, regeneration, restorative, particularly regenerative, popped up, I had a real issue with that relative to sustainability because my thesis was in sustainability. So um, the framing on that the ecological design lens is actually trying to be as inclusive as possible, and I agree that the way it's stated here is really narrow, but each, I think anybody that looked at those particular topics, if you were focused on restorative, you would probably say the description here is too narrow. And I would also say that if you were focused on regenerative, you would say that description is too narrow. And I would also include that actually the description we have on resiliency, is that is adapt, shock resistant, is in fact too narrow. Um, the challenge is getting all those lenses on this one slide and giving a simple frame that people can remember, at least that captures the essence of it. So I would be really open to discussion with a whole variety of people that want to sort of work on framing that. Um, and that's been a tough dialogue. We've been working on that nationally for a long time. So um, I, don't, I don't disagree with the sort of narrowness of those definitions and would be very delighted to have more conversations. Well, I, I would observe just in, in the creation of green subsidies, we spend <clears throat> in the creation of green subsidies and in figuring out what to call it, we spend sort of a, a nauseating amount of time sort of looking at different frames and words and, and ultimately, so we pick green, which is, you know, it's not ideal, but, um, and it, it maybe needs to change, although I thought of putting a dollar sign across the S and the step. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but I think I think ultimately it's what what resonates in city councils across Minnesota. And you have, you know, I mean city council, those members are the ones who can control a lot because certainly in terms of land use, we know cities have Minnesota's the greatest capacity for change. And um, what resonates, you know, all those Fine discussions during the 90s on what is sustainable. Um, it feels like a sustainable and resilient, resilient mitigation adaptation. I, I'm not. I don't think we need to be as concerned um, with learning and holding on to sustainability. We're seeing it a lot. We're seeing a lot of these major organizations like Obama and Homeland Security. I think resilience. Really uh, interesting 
know, uh, John Carmody and I had some conversations probably about this time, about a year ago, about what kinds of frames are out there and what's the dialogue. And we talked to them about you know, resiliency as being a good as being a good framework. Um, or a lot of people would relate relate to. Um, the reason so to put that in perspective, the naming thing, we started out working on something similar to this in the AIA code and Laura actually alluded to this early on. We started out and we had, I don't know, we went through four different names, sustainable integrated design and development, which the acronym turned out to be SID. And everyone thought it had to do with babies, so we crashed that. <laughs> yeah. um, regenerative integrated process, which turned out to be RIP, and we had to trash that because it had its own sort of con conversations, and regenerative which is a great frame, had already been sort of from the sort of a space that was being utilized on that and it was uh, putting together a list was not something that regenerative the people in regenerative were interested in doing. So we ended up with uh, sort of resiliency and for many reasons, more than just naming convention, it's like the topics in it are obviously important. I ended up using the frame living design after searching for four, five, six years trying to figure out what to use. And that seemed to be the best fit. So, um, at Terry's point, um, being comprehensive and uh, creating something that people can have a around uh, is really important. And that's a real challenge to do that. That's just, so, kind of looking across the frameworks seemed to be a possible way to do it and a way to view the diversity, actually, in the way people see this topic. I know we're five minutes over to set up our script for it. Just make sure to keep us in mind with the conference and plan update. Thinking, you know, holistically and absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Sarah and Doug again, please. And, uh, and then uh, we can have conversations out in the hall.